Live from Palo Alto, California, it's The Cube at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Welcome back, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are at the Pier 2.0 Foundation event in Palo Alto, California. As you know, we like to take theCUBE out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, get the smartest people in the room we can find, bring them on, ask them the questions that you'd like to ask them, and really share the knowledge. So we're joined here in our next segment by Andy Davidson. He is the CTO of Allegro Networks and a self-reported network automation and peering geek. So uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, Jeff. So, uh, you just got out of your session, right? You That's gave right. a little session, so for the people that weren't able to join, why don't you give us a little background about what you covered in your session? So in the session, I talked about uh, the important aspects that uh, a service provider would need to go through if they wanted to do automation on the network. Uh, automation's really, really important because uh, service providers want to give a consistent experience for their customers. They need to ramp up the number of customers they can deal with at scale. And doing that through traditional means uh, leads uh, to inaccuracies. It leads to uh, processes that don't result in happy customers. Automation is really, really important. And we were one of the first people to explore automation uh, as, as the reason for the company, as, uh, some, uh, as a reason to, to experiment and innovate and, uh, and, and try and reach new customers. So, uh, so it's, it's been a really, really interesting journey. I wanted to share that with other service providers. So how did you parse out that challenge, right? Because everyone talks about automating, right? Automating everything, and you know, at, at what point uh, can you automate? At what point do you start to automate? Did you, did you look for really problematic errors that are causing problems? Did you look for low-hanging fruit that was just easy to do? And, and then the other thing, once you started down that path, what generally happens is you automate one thing and that just kind of moves your yeah. problem to a different spot. Exactly. So talk a little bit about kind of how you set a course. So uh, we started out by, um, when, we, when we established that we wanted to build uh, network services, we looked at why buying network services from uh, the organizations that will become our competitors really, really sucked. And uh, I've been buying these kind of products for around 15 years of my career, and every single time it's been painful because you have to deal with 20 different people inside an organization. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the way that the services got rolled out is, a, is something called a ticket moves between different departments. Right. Each department rolls it out incorrectly. You, you're months from the point in which you need a service to when it can be delivered. And we worked out that uh, with consistent business processes that lead to software, you can get rid of all of that. You can, you can replace it with uh, automation so that services are rolled out there and then for customers in a consistent manner. Um, so, and that, that means they can unlock revenue today or do innovation today. And that was the reason. And so, how many steps did you guys automate in, in what was what's kind of the, the, the process before? So we, we took um, a, a lean methodology to the way that we, uh, we started automation. So we, uh, we worked out what the, uh, what's the least amount of work we can do to test the concept. Okay. So we, we started very clearly with one, with one service, which was uh, a provider in a data center in one town needs to connect their network to a data center in another town. Can we get that stage completely automated? Can we allow them to go to a web portal, define what they want, and roll out that service for them? So we had this full suite of services that we wanted to automate, like IP transit, interconnections uh, and internet exchange points and plugging into other parties over the network but we started with that simple piece can we take this product and make it um, a simple step for uh, automation and, and just in terms of scale and the importance to your business how often were you doing that type of uh of a, of a task. Well, it would be it would be more than once for every single circuit on the network because you have um, you have a, a point in which you make the circuit for the customer between building A and building B. But the customer's requirements change and evolve over the time. They need more capacity, or they need to do maintenance and change it to a different technology. So every time you have a circuit, there's a minimum of one thing that you have to do with that circuit. Okay. But there's normally two, three, four over the course of two or three years. So it's it's literally every single time we come into contact with a customer. And how many steps were in that process when it was the ticket process? And how many people did it touch? So you'd normally uh, have to speak to a salesperson first of all, who would spend a week dancing around the handbag until you really, really needed that circuit and then wouldn't try and get a discount. Okay. And then it would go to uh, uh, some kind of assurance team who, who agreed that the circuit was possible to deliver. There was capacity on the link, even though you'd agreed a price and a service. Then it would go to operations. 
um, who would actually install, roll out the service, and uh, then you'd end up dealing with the network operator centre to go and put right all the things wrong that the provisioning and operations team had done right, when they built your right. circuit. So it could such, uh, a circuit provision could such five or six people on a small service provider, and it could such a five or six teams on a big service provider. And now you can such one web portal and have the service live in five minutes. And you've got a lot of interconnects and interdependencies, right, with other departments, other entities, You've built that all into your software. Yeah, a, p a perfect example here is somebody who, who maybe sells cloud services, cloud uh, hosted applications, or uh, people who, uh, who want to interconnect to the big cloud providers like uh, Amazon, Rackspace, uh, Microsoft. They need, um, they need to turn up circuits quickly because they're fueling innovation inside their organization with their ability to move data into the cloud. Um, and, and yeah, they. Um, uh, that, that's exactly how we uh, how we approach the subject of, uh, of of dealing with multiple providers. As long as you have a simple portal and you behave in a consistent manner every time, then those business processes turn straight into software that uh, that delivers the services people need. So, talk a little bit about your CTO. It doesn't say you know VP uh, engineer. You're not. I'm sure you guys have plenty of software in your products, but you probably don't have kind of IT services software. So, talk about. You know, did you have to kind of you know, become a little bit more of a, a software company within your service provider arm? And, and how was that? You know, did people like that? Is that did, did they grasp it? Were they excited about it? And then how did you actually execute and deliver a successful you know, commercial software product? So it becomes, um, it, it's, it's a great question that because uh, there's, there's absolutely no way you can, you can uh, build a project like this, build a product like this without really, really good cross department discipline because um, network technologies, network configuration, network services are, are, um, are can be complex, you know, because you're, uh, the, the rules you have to follow if you're going to have uh, a service that's compatible with what every customer needs, and uh, there's a lot of things that are possibly not logical uh, to people that don't really understand internet plumbing, internet core engineering, like uh, when a peering decision will be a yes, when it will be a no, when a decision to interconnect or just use a VPN over the internet will take place, and so. Uh, we hired some really, really great software engineering people that have worked in um, web portal design uh, and uh, complex application construction, but not in the networking space. So we had to uh, work really hard to make sure that knowledge moved between the network engineering team, the service delivery team, and the uh, software development team, absolutely. Um, otherwise, we, we couldn't have, uh, have, have built the platform that we did in the time that we did. And uh, I know our uh, software developers joined in June of last year, and we launched the minimum viable product in September of last year. So we rolled out an entire automation suite in the time it takes some carriers to roll out a circuit. Right, right, and how many people in that team, just orders of magnitude, in uh, your software development team? Software development team uh, is, uh, is two people. It's two people, And uh, <laughs> And across the organization we have 20 people, and we look after a data center spanning the length and breadth of the UK. Right, so you talked about you know delivering the, you know, kind of the low-hanging fruit, the minimum, Minimum level. Let's get it started. Let's proof of concept. So, how many more? How many more services have you automated uh, via this path so far? So, um, so September, you said, right? Yeah. Was the first one rolled out, and so now almost a year later. So we looked at um, uh, the, the the core service provider building blocks that every service provider needs to buy, so that we could start to push uh, push those out automation as well. So, uh, connections to internet exchange points. You can do that through. Uh, a process that's as automated as possible, connection to IP transit, which is a wholesale connection to the internet at large. Um, but also the, uh, the really, really interesting thing that we wanted to work on, the reason we did all of this work, first of all, was to allow uh, different providers, either two different companies, provider A and provider B, or service provider A and cloud provider B, to plug into each other over our network, um, which in terms of uh, engineering complexity isn't a great deal different to building um, a link, building a circuit between a single provider's network. But of course, there's so much business logic involved. Um, you know, making sure that the technical parameters that two competing organisations um, uh, require for the circuit come together, mm -hmm. um, and all that has to be done through the portal. And uh, we we mirrored the the type of conversations that different service providers have uh, when they come to agree to make an interconnection through the stages through our portal. So using our portal to make a provider A, provider B circuit uh, is a lot like the, uh, having the conversation with the other provider uh, which uh, where you'd agree parameters for turning up the circuit. And how well were you able to replicate that in software? That sounds like much more of a, a people negotiation yep. than necessarily a trade-off. 
uh, so in software. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, it's a lot like uh, social networking in some ways. So when we um, when we first started. Uh, demoing to our software development team just how this conversation works. Essentially two guys who work for service providers go and meet in a bar or at a conference like this okay. and say we need to plug into each other and enable this service. Uh, we, we drew out the steps, we role-played the steps, we, we wrote down the steps and our software developer team looked at it and said this is like a Facebook friend request. So we could borrow <laughs> we could <laughs> we could borrow uh, concepts from uh, social networking to use for provider A, provider B interconnection because the conversation is quite a lot like hey shall we hook up on Facebook Facebook. Right, that's terrific. So, how has the success in this, um, you know, kind of toe in the water, if you will, process in terms of developing software to enable this, this connection between companies and, and, and underlying technology? But it's really more about connecting companies. How has that changed within your group and your team and maybe your senior management in terms of opening up new opportunities that maybe nobody ever even thought of before? So that's uh, that, that's the, uh, the an, another key reason why we had the vision of let's let's cause circuits to happen at the pace in which people can innovate because that will maybe cause them to innovate faster, and uh, we we certainly see um, it's it's always been the case that you can get um, uh, like cloud big data services available uh, in an instant. Uh, or uh, CPU compute power available in an instant. Um, and having the network capacity to join all of these different instant delivered services together at, uh, at really, really high speed has um, uh, unlocks uh, the, the ability to push data into those environments. Uh, and we certainly see customers doing this. Uh, we have some customers that work in e-commerce who, um, who uh, wanted to move data from their own databases, which are stored in a big, tin inside uh, traditional data centers, they wanted to move that data into um, a, a big data cloud provider, an instant deliver big data company, um, and they could, they, they found that they had a, a challenge of how they were going to get the data out of their infrastructure into this cloud service provider so that they could analyze it and better understand their customers and prioritize their own uh, work patterns. They, they wanted to innovate in the way that they did business and they, they struggled to do that because they just couldn't figure out how to move the data around. And we met them, we showed them how they could do it really, really quickly uh, and, and tie into a, a big data platform that's on our network. Uh, and they could see right away, this is this is how we can move the data around, this is how we can do it. And they, and they brought the additional service straight away. They used that to, to, to power innovation inside their own organization in ways that uh, we didn't necessarily think would be what people used it for when we started for this. But right, so we, right. we always knew that we would end up having these conversations over and over again and, uh, and uh, finding new ways for people to work. We knew we'd have them over again. So is this, is this service uh, provided as part of their core uh, services that they buy from you, or is this an additional product? So are you actually launching a new product line with this with this service? Uh, no, you could. It's uh, every product is able. Every customer, sorry, is able to order every product. So uh, when you, uh, if you're a service provider, if you have a network, you can log on to our portal, uh, and that allows you to uh, to buy all of the services. But the portal itself is not is not a for fee. It's just it's just part of what they get when they're doing yes, business with exactly. you, right? So it's an it's an enabler. Exactly. It's infrastructure. Absolutely, because um, we uh, we encourage and we want people to use the portal because then they can deliver the services themselves right away. Um, it's not business hours in the UK right now, but one of our customers uh, who needs an interconnection to another customer or somebody who needs extra capacity between two data centers can log onto our portal and uh, and enable that those services right now. It doesn't matter that it's not business hours. It doesn't matter that our salespeople are at home. Hopefully they're at home having a lovely evening, right? Because um, <laughs> no, they the, should the be portal, selling. Come on. <laughs> the, portal, the portal's doing all that work for them. Right. So um, a customer, we, we specifically want a customer to have access to the portal and to use the portal right. because that's, uh, that enables um, the instant delivery. So they get it for free as soon as they have any service. Right. So you touched on it a little bit about this service that you're providing, which is really just to simplify and remove human errors and and expedite things at, at the speed that people want it done um, saves money. But we talked a little bit about off-air how it's really empowering your customers now to innovate in ways that they couldn't do before. And you, and you talked briefly about uh, this company now being able to take advantage of a big data analytic uh, process or service so that they could more uh, better react to their data. What if you can just share any other anecdotes about how you know what what, what feels like kind of hardcore plumbing really is enabling innovation at a different level and not really it's just not a cost savings right it's an unlocking additional value. Any other interesting stories you could share? So it's uh, it's uh, it's really that um, 
we have uh, we have, for example, hosting com companies on our network that uh, that are part of the solution, and um, they, there are customers on other hosting companies who have done other innovative things, and uh, plugging those together is the uh, is the innovation. So. Uh, somebody who has uh, a portal that can um, analyze uh, like web traffic logs we have uh, we have customers customers who have services like that that can do that in real time and look for new ins insights uh, to do with uh, like web performance or customer trend analysis and uh, having having the private link that can be built over our network means that um, some totally different hosting company who doesn't, who, who never had that idea, um, can plug into that service provider and uh, and start to use that service the day that they've, the day that they've discovered them. That's the thing that it allows people to do. It's a, uh, the innovation right now is a time to market thing, I guess, rather okay. than uh, fueling new ideas. But I know we have customers who are working on brand new ideas that having instant delivered network can enable. Right. Right now it's a time to market innovation, but right. there's, there's it's time to market innovation. matters, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. real time, whatever real time means. We talked about that a little bit. Our last mm. interview. Um, it means something to, to everyone, not necessarily the same thing to everyone. Sure. So let's shift gears a little bit. Why are you here? Why is this an important event? Um, and, what, and what brought you here? So I was uh, really interested to find out what uh, uh, people who, uh, who were new to the peering industry wanted to know. So uh, because I've been, I've been doing peering for over 10 years and uh, from my perspective it hasn't changed enormously. The speeds have got bigger, um, the number of people you can interconnect to is, uh, has increased. But uh, the, the really, really interesting thing here is what is it that the, the guys working on the brand new networks, the brand new service providers, what questions do they have? And that allows us to, uh, to put that into our peering products because the questions they have, if we can answer them through our portal, then, uh, then it becomes easy for them to do business with us. It's a simple, simple And are they significantly like different than what you expected or what you've seen over the last 10 years? Um, I've what are some of the differences with the new guys, the new, the new blood that's coming up? So I, um, I, I see people looking for greater simplicity uh, because for me it didn't, seem, um, it, it didn't seem odd when I joined the industry that there were the complex lead times for circuits and it, it didn't seem odd that uh, it was the case that you had to literally go and uh, meet hundreds of people to get the interconnections you needed to make the, uh, your, your network perform optimally. And some of the best questions that, uh, uh, that I've asked people or the people in the audience have asked uh, uh, from academic or uh, people who are moving into interconnection roles at service providers, some of the best questions they've asked is, but why? And uh, when you start to answer that question, uh, you start to realize that actually uh, there are things that we can do, to, there are steps that we can take out of, uh, of the interconnection process and uh, logic that we can build into the portal that, um, that, that answer that but why question on the lines of, well, maybe you don't need to do that anymore. Right. Maybe, uh, maybe it should be the case that certain things are taken as forgiven or, and uh, I think it'll in, uh, inform the next stage of our portal development so that uh, we can start to ask but why uh, more often. And I think that's been the most interesting thing. I just, I just love how you know we, we often talk about the consumerization of IT, and it's really all about expectations, right? Yeah. And now you're talking about a new generation, and as we we've, we've said a few times before, there's a huge representation here of, of students um, and young people who have a very different expectation about how things should work, what types of response time they should they should get, and as you said, just how easy things should be without necessarily the full appreciation of yeah. what's happening behind the covers, but that's okay because they know best of breed application delivery as evidenced by Facebook and, yep. and Amazon and Google and the things that they interact with is sets the standard for what they hope everything else will act like. Absolutely. Interesting. Um, so I want to shift gears one more time uh, before we let you go. So uh, your soft-spoken guy came over from the UK. Um, I just want to ask, you know, we think of the internet as, as global, right? We have global companies, we're on the news, we see what's happening all the time. But talk a little bit about what's different um, in the UK and uh, in, in Europe in general from what's happening here uh, in the US. Get your perspective on that. Well, that's, uh, I, could, uh, I could, I can really unlock the, uh, uh, a whole uh, half hour conversation <laughs> here by mentioning things like net neutrality and uh, uh, the tendency to interconnect in general. Um, a lot of the, uh, th there's been a lot of uh, time in our press about um, uh, conversations that uh, big networks in the U.S. have with big content players in the U.S. about uh, who should pay and uh, 
uh, who shouldn't pay for access to each other's network. Uh, an interesting difference between the uh, UK and the US ecosystems is that it's much more common for a uh, UK or a European player to agree to make an interconnection with one another or um, much, uh, much more likely that uh, they'll make a, an interconnection to a content delivery network pro provider because they understand that uh, both sides are having a big win in terms of the customer experience. Right. And I, th I think that that's, uh, it, it's led to a, a market in Europe whereby it's really, really easy to build service providers, it's really, it's, it's really easy to build an ISP, it's really, really easy to introduce content and serve, and I think that it's done great things for competition and therefore pricing for consumer services, and it's done great things for uh, increasing the, the uh, uh, speed by which uh, content innovation can happen because there is this greater tendency for competing organizations to work together and build an interconnection. Um, I'd love to see the, uh, the US market open up in that way and uh, it's become more likely to, for people to build bigger, um, uh, bigger interconnections between the networks because right. it will result in a performance win for end users in right. North America. Now what's interesting here is that you know, the, the flashpoint use case right, is, is Comcast and Netflix, um, which is you know, getting all the pub. But what's ironic is the cable industry used to be extremely distributed, right? There was a ton of mom and pops because nobody knew what was going on uh, when there was the big network uh, system. And, and Comcast and Time Warner and a few others have, have kind of aggregated that over time. So now there's not that many providers as there used to be. So has that not happened in, in the UK in terms of the service providers? Have they just been able to maintain a much diverse, more diverse population and they haven't had that roll up? I mean, do you think that's kind of well, a actually big we, difference? We, we did have a very, very similar uh, cable TV roll up. Um, uh, just as you've described here, the, uh, there was, uh, you used to buy cable TV from your city's cable TV provider and uh, uh, that's not the case anymore. But uh, we're, we, but um, in, uh, in some places in North America you have the option to buy DSL from a relatively small number of providers, but pretty much in every town in the UK you have your choice to buy service from uh, over 100 ISPs. 100? So, so uh, essentially that traffic has, has got to get between all of those ISPs somehow, and uh, yeah, there are so many people that sell on um, uh, the incumbents' uh, wholesale platform. There's so many ISPs who've built their own circuits, uh, their own last mile. There's the cable company, uh, there are wireless providers. There's, there are, there's a great choice in most uh, most cities, and you can. There are literally that many um, ISPs that you can choose from. And that, did that come from the density of the population? I mean, it's always kind of the last mile problem. I mean, or was there regulations where a lot more ISPs had access to the wires into the home? I mean, it seems like an environmental structure that would that would enable that. Yeah, there's uh, there's, there's definitely uh, relatively open access to uh, last uh, last mile connectivity that's owned by the incumbent, but there's also been it's also been uh, relatively simple for. Uh, not simple, it's always been expensive and difficult to build networks touching right. uh, so many households in a city, but it's, there's always been a, a, a culture that's allowed um, people to dig new fibre into the streets, dig new um, last mile into the street, and uh, in, in most cities you also have a, a choice of a number of uh, a wireless providers. I don't mean cellular providers here. I mean people who can do um, very high-speed uh, Ethernet services over uh, Wi-Fi style equivalents. So really uh, dedicated, and, dedicated yeah. Wi-Fi networks. Yes. Okay. And of course, we have uh, we have fierce competition in the cellular space as well. Right. And we right. have uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, young people buying just uh, cellular service, not buying fixed uh, broadband into their. Their first homes or to their student halls or something, we're seeing, we're seeing the substitution of a fixed line services. Yeah, here are the kids in the back, it's live TV. <laughs> <laughs> they got a bunch of kids downstairs. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Well, the point is, they'll be buying, if they were in the UK, they'll be buying different services to what we were buying to get into the access and telecoms into the home. This is interesting. So, we're, we're going to have to get you back on. We're getting the hook here uh, to go to our next guest, but this is a really interesting conversation because it's really more of an infrastructure situation Absolutely. that enables what's now becoming a pretty hot topic here in the U.S. All right, so Andy, thanks for coming on. Thank Andy uh, Davidson, CTO of Allegro Networks. I'm Jeff Frick, you're on theCUBE. We're at the Peer 2.0 Foundation event in Palo Alto, California. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.